Hi, this is Phil Kerner, the Tool and Die Guy, and welcome to another real life manufacturing lesson. Um, tonight we're going to talk about a small subplate for your milling machine. This is a follow up on the previous lesson, and we're going to talk about uh, something vintage. I know some of you guys like that stuff. This is called the Starrett 269A taper gauge. So let's get started with that. Um, this is it, the Starrett 269A taper gauge. And at first, it looks like some sort of a feeler gauge, right, with all these uh, different uh, leafs coming off of a central point here. looks just like a feeler gauge, but you see the um, uh, graduations here. So the smallest one is at 100, and the largest one is at 500. Now, what would you use that for? Well, let's take a look at something we just did uh, in the last lesson. We discussed this optical center punch. And what had happened here, uh, the fellow who made it was a student. And um, the stem on this magnifying glass is 3 eighths of an inch. This uh, punch is 3 eighths of an inch. And both holes are 3 eighths of an inch. So they stick. So I just ran a 376 reamer through those just to give them a slip fit. So let's take the taper gauge and slide it in there. and You can see this is old. It's got some patina on it, as they would say in American Pickers. And uh, But there you go. 380 there, and we go down 379, 378, 377, 376. Pretty accurate. So I'm always amazed that uh, A, Starrett still makes these things, uh, but they do, and brand new, they're about $140. I see them on eBay for about 50 bucks. Uh, in my opinion, they're kind of, at this point in time, a, a good conversational piece. A uh, conversation piece, I should say. And uh, I guarantee you, if you do pick up a set and walk around the shop, nobody will know what these are unless you have a fog there like me. And uh, I'm the one that didn't know what an optical uh, center punch was. So that should take care of that. So pretty cool and a uh, nice little addition if you want to show them off. But uh, there you have it, the Starrett 269A taper gauge. So let's talk about today's lesson. Before we get into the video portion of it, um, here we go. We talked about, uh, I made this little subplate to put my Kurt Weiss. And these are some 3 quarter by 5 by 7 plates that uh, were left over from a job. Boy, there's about 100 of them on a skid. And over the last 8 years or so, I've probably used half of them for little fixture plates. In this case, I just took one and I just uh, walked around it, squared it up in the mill. So it's maybe a little under 5 by 7. And it's 3 quarters of an inch thick. And I drilled a series of bolt holes in there, one inch apart. And there's a lot more to it than that. So let's go into the video section of the lesson. Okay, in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about this little fixture plate I built, like a little sub plate for your vise. Now, in the last video, I was talking about we have a bunch of these in our shop. And there was some material that was cut off wrong. So over the years, I've commandeered many of these little plates to use for quick fixture plates or setups. And uh, in the last video, I was talking about how I used it to hold this part down so I could tip it up on a 45-degree angle. And the reason, of course, we did that is I couldn't clamp here or I'd squeeze these ears shut. So I had to hold it down. I couldn't grind these slots. It would take way too long. And this hit would hit the back of the hub on the grinder, so they had to be milled. So as I was deburring and finalizing these parts, as I said, we've got a lot of these plates laying around. I just set this up in my Mazak, and, and I wrote a grid program, literally one line of code, uh, seven across, five down, one inch spacing, drilled and tapped a bunch of 3 8 holes. Now, the nice thing about, I, I usually like dowel pins too to locate off of, but uh, I'm usually more in need of screw holes than I am dowel pin holes because I'm these weird parts. I need a lot of options here to be able to hold parts like this, so like all the screw holes. But then I thought, well, you know, I have these, and those are cut off shoulder bolts. Here's a, here's a shoulder bolt, right? So I just cut the heads off of them, or not cut the heads, I grind the heads down so I still have the hex there, and that's what they look like. I still have the hex in the bottom, but it's a, a dowel pin. So for the fun of it, after I did this, I put some dowel, I, I screwed these in all the way down. I'm not going to waste the time doing it now. And I ran an indicator across the, the pins. Well, they weren't too good. Uh, I think the two end ones weren't bad. The middle one was five thousandths one way. And I think I put one in here. They just weren't as, as straight as you'd like them. So after thinking about it, I thought about it. Well, do we really know if the threads on a shoulder bolt are perfectly concentric with the this diameter? We don't. And they're probably fairly close. So what I did to prove that is I had, well, I saw the program is I took and milled these, uh, these as you know, shoulder bolts are a few thousandths undersized, so this is 
this instead of being a half, this is around 497 diameter. I circle milled them out 50 thousandths deep to 498. And then what you do is you take your shoulder bolts, it's if you need some stop pins or something like that, or a rail, and you screw them in. And they, that one, they both kind of stopped a little bit. And what you're going to do then with your Allen wrench is shove it into that 50 thousandths deep counter board. And when I do that, this one's a little tight because we're shoving it in there. We're putting it once where we want it to be. And, and if I put one in here and do the same thing, screw it all the way down. That one I think went all the way in already. That was pretty lined up. Now when I indicate across these, these pins uh, within a thou, and that's good enough for the work I do, okay? And then I came this way, and these were perfect. So basically what I did was I put the counter bores in to, to make sure these cut off shoulder bolts, or ground down shoulder bolts, I, keep, I should call them that, now are being forced into a good position. So now I've got the best of both worlds with this little plate. I've got all the screw holes I could possibly want. And now, and now I've got a, a dowel pins to use for stops as I need them, and I can arrange any way I want. So for what took a 20-minute a project while I was deburring another project, uh, I have now have this really cool little fixture plate, and I already used it. And I'll show you here I had, I had a little ring I had to machine a bolt circle in, and I put uh, two pins in here, butted it up against it, and then used the center uh, hole, put a... Put a uh, a uh, hold down across the middle that would miss the bolt pattern and worked out perfectly already. So I used it the same day I made it. So that's pretty cool. So I hope you enjoyed that little subplate. It is uh, five by seven by three quarter thick. And uh, that's it. It's not hard. And I remember back in the mold making days we made everything hard. I don't bother hardening stuff anymore. You know why? Uh, if, you, if you bump it, you know what? You can always remachine it. Uh, if you want it flat again, or if your uh, nick embarrasses you, number two, um, you don't. If you do bump it, you don't break your cutter. It's just not. I don't see the, the need to harden stuff like this now. If this was going in the grinding room, different story. But on the mill, eminently usable, and it's a, another little subplate for my machine that I'll get a lot of use out of. So hope you enjoyed that one. Also, look forward to your comments and uh, questions, and uh, we'll see you on the next video.